Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Football Podcast. It is me, Joey P. Joe Pizzapia with me today is Andrew Erickson, Mr. Big Pod Energy himself, and the one, the only from The Athletic, the all-in kid, my best bud. Jake Seeley is with us also, and today it's about that list of guys we don't want. That's right. And to me, this is the most important thing. You know, you want to make sure you kind of cut off the players you don't like at certain ADPs, the players that are just not going to end up on your rosters. It's very important to like certain players. It's very important also to find the ones that you don't. And we're going to talk about them, the wide receivers and the running backs, those players at current ADPs that we're just not feeling this year. And if there's one thing these two guys are feeling this year, it's getting married because both of them this calendar year have already dropped to one knee and proposed to their one ones. So uh, I'm the only bachelor left on this show, which is fine by me. That's good. But uh, Jake Seeley, I know you just recently got engaged. Uh, so now I guess the question is, can you continue to be such a juggernaut in this ranking industry <laughs> now that you've got wedding planning going on? I like that was the first thing everybody's mm -hmm. there's two two responses that everybody had that, that weren't in the industry because everybody like you congratulations and i appreciate of it course. Joe. by the way you you got married before us though so you actually i did to and like, divorced well so i'm ahead of you yeah, on that one too. that is true you're just <laughs> you a couple go. years behind me there buds <laughs> the two responses i got were congratulations i'm gonna miss the date fail stories mm -hmm. and then congratulations this isn't gonna screw up your ranks right <laughs> Like that's like, like everybody like when I get engaged and just be like, all right, screw you guys. You figure it out your own. I gave you the customized projection sheet sheet. You go make your own projections. I don't care about you anymore. Screw you guys. I'm going home. Well, I guess that's the question, too. It's like, you know, now now it's like, oh, I don't know. Amari Cooper's the one one wide receiver. I don't know, guys. I got to go see well, the caterer today. Might, I'm busy. Might as might as well. I mean, we're not we're crucifying Cooper Cup for some dumb reason. This shit. Like, don't get me started again. It's my entire week has been Cooper Cup and I've been pissed off about it. Good. I, I love it. Angry Jake is always my favorite, Jake. I love when you hulk out. It's the best. Uh, Andrew Erickson, uh, you were ahead of Sealy here. And I don't know if anybody had that in the pool that Erickson will get engaged before Sealy, but everybody, did, I guess everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Everybody probably did. Erickson, uh, same goes to you. Same question. Do you think, you know, all this wedding planning, the DJ versus the band having to go try the different cakes? You know what happens if that happens on a Sunday, and that's the only we time we had that you can conversation go. last night. I'm do? sorry to, so I'm sorry to interrupt. We legitimately, Nicole and I, legitimately had that conversation last night. DJ versus band. I'm sorry. Just go ahead. I'm just laughing because we just talked about that. Well, you gotta, you gotta play that. But what if you have to go see the band on a Sunday afternoon, Erickson? What are you gonna do? No, this is this is a very you know loaded question that we mm -hmm. have, or I have with my fiance Taylor, where we talk about okay. She's pushing for a, you know, early September wedding. And I'm like, uh, no, like I really like June. Like June is like really prime mm -hmm. time for me. And it's like trying to, you know, you have to make sacrifices, obviously being in a relationship that's going to end in, in marriage. So you have to kind of meet halfway. <laughs> it was good for a while. I didn't know how it was going to end there for a second. You got to meet halfway at some right. point. So if she wants to do it during football season, I at least would have to be on a Friday as opposed to being on a Saturday. So that way I'll have more time to react to the news. So yeah, it's, it's something that's always going on, but right. ultimately I'm just trying to push everything into the summer months where I can disappear for a month and no one's going to know because nothing's happening. So hopefully not in September. Well, don't worry if Erickson and Jake Seeley leave you for a weekend. We've always got the fantasy football draft kit at fantasy pros to pick you up and get you prepared oh, over at fantasypros.com slash kit. You can get it right now. It's got all the analysis, the ADP, the player profiles, the position primers, everything and more. It's all right there for you. And it's for free. But of course, if you're a premium subscriber to fantasy pros, you get so much more of that draft kit again that's fantasypros.com slash draft kit. Check it out today. And if you want to get more, I keep telling everybody fantasypros.com slash offers. Keep hammering it. I know many of you have. You've been telling me, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. You go to fantasypros.com slash offers. All you have to do is make a small deposit in one of our partner sites. And just like that, you get six free months access to our premium features and our premium content. That means you have access on our Discord to us, to the AMAs, to the stages. That means you have all the in-season tools, my playbook to manage your rosters, get all your rosters in one spot from all the different sites on fantasy pros not to mention all the amazing draft tools the draft assistant with sync the the cheat sheet creator the draft intel it's all there for you and it's free all you have to do is go to fantasypros.com slash offers to get it today and make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel because just days from now the fantasy football fest is going to happen august 29th right here 
3 p.m. Eastern, be there or be square. It's the Fantasy Fest on Monday, six hours of fantasy football content. We've got the biggest guests you could possibly imagine in the industry. We're going to be talking football for six straight hours. So make sure you subscribe to Fantasy Bros YouTube channel. And thank you and shout out to everybody who's been a subscriber. We have crossed 150,000 subscribers in our YouTube channel. Woohoo! What up? Great job, everybody. We appreciate you. I just want to say thank you. And I want to thank Chris and all of our uh, people who work behind the scenes here, Fancy Pros, for making such incredible work. All the content team, all the behind the scenes team to uh, make such a huge milestone here for us 150K. We appreciate all of you because without you, the Fantasy Pros family, this stuff doesn't work. So the other thing that doesn't work is some of these players at current ADP. So let's get into it. We're going to start here with the running backs, and we're going to start with guys from number one to one to uh, to 25, not 125. That would be a too big of a group. From one to 25 in terms of overall ADP, Andrew Erickson, let's start with you today. Give me the guy that right now you are not drafting in that range at RB. So right now, Derrick Henry in the ADP is number four overall. And that's just, that's way too high for me to take a running back that I think has a lot of, of red flags, you know, on his profile heading into this season. Not excited about the Titans offense, not excited about their offensive line. And Derrick Henry showed last year that he's mortal, basically. You know, he had this unsustainable workload, like 30 touches per game, and he ended up breaking down. Like he was able to not finish out the year. And you look at his advanced metrics in terms of rushing yards created over expectation per attempt is the first time since 2018 that he didn't rank inside the top five. So he was 23rd in that category, right around zero. So he really wasn't adding more rushing yards versus what was the expectation that was created from his offensive line and the offensive circumstances. So what that's telling me is as Henry gets older, entering 28 years old, he's starting to become more dependent on his surroundings as opposed to being the bulldozer that creates all of this yardage and touchdowns and big plays on his own. Like, I think we're going to see less of that in 2022, just based on what happened last year. And I mean, this Titans offense, there's a lot of question marks about it. So to invest a top five pick in a running back that does not catch passes, like mm -hmm. he's still yet to show that at the NFL level that he's going to be consistently used in the passing game. I just think that there's a really scary downside to Derrick Henry as a top five pick. Like I need security with a guy that I'm going to draft that highly. I want players on good offenses that I can draft that highly. And if they're not in a good offense at the running back position, I have to know, okay, at least they're going to catch passes out of the backfield if the team is trailing. So for me, I'm not taking Derrick Henry in the top five. I don't care for Derrick Henry slander, but I, I do believe you made some good points. And it's that pass catching ability that continues to pump up guys like Dalvin Cook and even Christian McCaffrey, who missed a lot of time. But I understand how tantalizing that is. You make a lot of good points. So Derrick Henry at four. I understand that thought process. You have him at 11. Uh, let's talk about you, Jay. Give me a guy in the first rung there, that one through 25 group that has you a little worried overall in ADP at the running back position. Yeah, well, for, um, Andrew and I might have to do a player debate here because I have Derrick Henry inside my top five. So we might have to. Me like, too. <laughs> that's because we're like smart a... and handsome, but that's OK. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, well, Andrew's well, you know what? Let, let's let's talk about it. Show. Why 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 is he uh, the top five for you? Well, what's the counter argument? Well, the counter argument for me is I don't see the workload going anywhere, even when we've had poor teams at times for the Titans the past two years, and for the fact he ranked in front of Jalen Taylor in half and full point PPR by the same margin in a per game metric. I, I completely understand the concerns about him, but. Mine comes down to if Derrick Henry plays 17 games, Derrick Henry is the top three running back. A hey, top three. Like, mm -hmm. If you want to play injury, but see, this is where I had a completely uh, separate. I was on Harris's podcast and I was like, it was about Barkley. And then it's the people that sit here. And I'm not saying and Andrew's doing this. I'm not coming for you for this way. But people sit here and be like, I'm OK with Christian McCaffrey, but I don't want Derrick Henry and Saquon Barkley. It's like you can't. You got it. If you're in the, I don't want the <laughs> wow, injury. Wow, that sounds boat, awfully familiar. Like Erickson's heard that about 700 times from me on this program. <laughs> But so that's why, like, again, I, I, I'm not going to say we're right and Andrew's wrong. Just that's where I'm coming from in this. The one that I don't like here is Nick Chubb. And it's not because I don't like Nick Chubb. If you want to argue, Andrew just said, I'm not going to take somebody in the top five unless I get some security. Well, if you want security, it is Nick Chubb. But the fact about Nick Chubb is he's going to finish RB nine to 12. That's where he is. It's because he doesn't have a high ceiling is because we've already seen you talk about the Derrick Henry thing is. 
Nick Chubb's just not used in the passing game. It's Kareem Hunt. When Kareem Hunt had the opportunity, they actually turned to Dearness Johnson. Dearness Johnson was the only one they treated as a bell cow. And it's just, it's not that I don't like Nick Chubb, but interestingly enough, and there's a player we're going to talk about that Andrew doesn't like at wide receiver. Everybody wants to come for that wide receiver. Everybody wants to come for this offense and crap all over this offense <laughs> and what it could be with Jacoby Brissett and still say, oh, well, it doesn't matter for Nick. Again, it's the same boat. You can't harp on everything about the Browns and then ignore Nick Chubb. Like, if it's one or the other. So I don't dislike Nick Chubb, but at 13, I have him around 25. He's still second round pick almost, but not, not as a fringe first round in no way. It's called selective logic, and that's what people like to do. They like to be logical, but only selectively when it suits the players that they well, like. And yes, exactly. Now, look, you're right. Nick Chubb is very safe. Uh, now, you've got him at 25 overall. Nick Chubb going at 13 overall. Yeah. That's a pretty big uh, scope there in terms of range. But I've seen drafts where Nick Chubb is as last to the third round. Nick Chubb's been around there. Yeah. And, and I've I actually had my team as a second running back. I couldn't believe it happened. I was up towards the top. I'm like, well, if you're going to give me Nick Chubb as my number two running back, I'll take that all day long. I love that right. ADP for him, yeah. but probably more appropriate, especially with Kareem Hunt still around. All right, let's go to another running back this time. Let's push the barrier. Let's go through 26 or 50 overall in ADP. Erickson, back to you. Give me the RB that you want no part of in this range. Uh, there's no way I'm drafting Antonio Gibson, <laughs> 38th overall. There, there's no way that's going to happen. There are so many red flags with Antonio Gibson right now. Just looking at the competition that he has in that backfield and looking at it when it was just JD McKissick last year. So in the games that he played with McKissick, 11 games, he had an 8% target share, averaged 12.1 fantasy points per game, which was RB23. So with McKissick, he was a back end RB2. And he finished as an RB2 in just 53% of his games, three of which came with McKissick out of the lineup. So you already have a guy that's a fringe running back two in an offense that we're not super excited about. And then you throw in a third round pick that is getting buzz, getting work at the goal line, getting work on early downs as Antonio Gibson continues to fumble away opportunities, work on special teams. And I mean, he had so many touches last year. You know, he was fourth in the NFL in touches, over 300 touches last year. And I just don't see that in his really in his range of outcomes with all these other running backs now involved in this backfield. They want to use more of a two committee approach. And look, if Gibson falls, yeah, there will be points at drafts where I will want to take him because he has been an RB1 over the past two seasons. But in the fourth round, like third round, like that's way too high for me to take a shot on Gibson when he may not even be an RB2 for me. And that's where you have to draft him where he's going right now. All right, let's move on to one of your guys here, Jake, in this same range. We're talking ADP from 26 to 50. Who's a running back that you want no part of in that range? David Montgomery. Uh, zero yeah. shares of David Montgomery. Zero. Here, the biggest thing here is I compare this backfield is to the Ravens backfield. So and why I bring that up is to say when you have a quarterback that's going to run as much as he is, you have to take that share out. So that means the running back, the lead running back, even if he gets a thousand eleven hundred yards, that's not a very high bar for fantasy purposes. I actually say it's kind of like a low ceiling for fantasy running backs. But it's coming down to the touchdown department. Like when we saw Mark Ingram and we saw the options with the Ravens reached RB1 level, but it was because 10, 12 touchdowns. I just don't think that's going to happen in this backfield, let alone Khalil Herbert. And I, this was mm -hmm. even before last week and Khalil Herbert getting all the touches. I was kind of reading the tea leaves of some of the beat reporters and what I believe in the talent of Herbert and said this, this is probably going to look a lot like the Broncos. Maybe not a pure 50-50, but even a 60-40 is going to kill this backfield for, again, it's not the Ravens touchdown upside. So I think it could be 60-40. I think it could be 50-50. And you're telling me to invest a pick in the top, what, 35 for a running back who's splitting touches in a backfield with a running quarterback in an offense where, again, let's talk about the quarterback in Justin Fields. How many touchdowns do we expect the running backs to score? Combined, maybe 10, like, mm. like 12. So I just, the split is just, I I, I hate, I love Darren Mc, David Montgomery and value past couple of years. I hate him now. Hate him. Sorry, David Montgomery. It's, no, it, no, <laughs> honestly, I'm right there with you. And I've been saying this all summer long, which is Khalil Herbert's investment to me is a no brainer because you saw he could carry the workload if something happened to Montgomery and it feels like they kind of want to work him in at some point in time. So yeah. that being said, all the things that you said negatively about this bears offense, does that also crush Khalil Herbert for you? Or you think it's late enough in the draft where it's okay to take that risk on him because it doesn't cost you anything to find out. 
Uh, because of that, it, you know, I'll okay. still take Herbert because right now you're getting a return on investment where yeah. it won't be the most appealing flex running back situation or RB three. But if you've hammered wide receivers, you have four wide receivers, just like a solid running back and you have to play Herbert as your RB two, maybe even got a tight end in your draft. I wouldn't hate it, but you just mentioned the upside for it is if we cleared out Herbert, if Herbert got hurt today. I'd be back in on Montgomery. If Montgomery got hurt today, we'd be in on Herbert. So that's why, as you already mentioned, it, we saw Herbert get the bell cow work last year and what he could do with it. Yeah, Herbert at 187 as opposed to Montgomery at 33. That is a big, <laughs> big difference. Also, what makes a big difference on draft day is, of course, Miller Lite, baby. Let's go. Let's get the hat on. It's Miller time, baby. Picking your fantasy team could be a crapshoot, but picking your beer for draft day doesn't have to be. Go to MillerLite.com slash buy beer online and you can get all the Miller light for your draft party. You can get it for your Sunday football. You can get it for your Monday night football, your Thursday football. Heck you could just get it because, but this year, think about it. You know, one less trip to the grocery store, the beer store, wherever the heck you call it and wherever you live. And the Miller comes right to your house at MillerLight.com slash buy beer online, friends, family, Miller light. That's what you need to make your draft just right. Oh, I, I didn't even mean to do that, but there's a little Dr. Seuss in all of us. Let's go to another grouping here and let's talk about the guys uh, in the 51 through 57, uh, 75 range here. I don't know what's going on with my numbers today. Uh, 51 through 75. Erickson, let's go back to you. Give me the running back in this range that Andrew Erickson says, no, no, he is not for me. Go with uh, Damian Harris uh, running back for the New England Patriots because I'm in on Ramondre Stevenson and there can only be one Patriots running back that I want to draft. So if you just look at the second half of last year, I mean, Stevenson forced a 50, 50 split, you know, basically coming out of the doghouse. Um, Harris got all the production from touchdowns though. So that's why, you know, Harris is viewed, you know, as a starting running back, he's still getting starting reps at camp, but you know, his 15 touchdowns last year were heavily inflated his overall fantasy production. We've seen Harris have a very limited role as a receiver. And I think, that's not going to change. Like he kind of is a early down back. That's really just thrived off being an efficient runner and scoring touchdowns. But now you have Stevenson taking on a larger role entering year two. He's the much more likely candidate to earn reps as a receiver out of the backfield alongside Ty Montgomery with James White retiring. And I think it's important to also recognize that it's a new run scheme that they're operating in new England here. So there's no guarantee that Harris is the preferred rusher in between the tackles or how efficient he'll be if they're changing up how the style of the running backs are being used. So for me, I'm still taking Stevenson. I, I mean, Joe, I mean, you took Stevenson over Damian Harris in the last mock draft we did. <laughs> I did. So I'm a bad boy. I mean, that's kind of where we're at. I have Stevenson ranked over Damian Harris. I mean, I saw Stevenson go, I think, in our flex draft. I think it was Scott Fish that took him in the sixth round. Like, mm -hmm. the, the Stevenson buzz is real right now, and I, I don't know if how many home leagues are going to catch on to that necessarily with Damian Harris still potentially going ahead, but I can't take Damon Harris, you know, with a top 60 pick here. That is a great point. And I think that's something that we need to drive home a lot more to people who are in more of the casual leagues and necessarily, you know, the expert ones or Scott Fishbowl or things of this nature. Most host sites are going to have Damian Harris ranked ahead of Ramondre Stevens. I can guarantee you that's going to be what the ADP looks like, right? So keep that in mind. If you want to get a later running back, Stevenson probably going to be there around maybe even two rounds later than Harris most of the time in the more casual leagues. It's something to always kind of store in the back of your head for those of you listening today. All right, let's go back to you here, Jake Seeley. 51 through 75 at ADP. Who's the running back that is not for Jakey Jakey? Miles Sanders, uh, similar with the situation in the passing game, but I, I'm actually in on Harris and Stevenson for what it's worth. I'll, I'll, I think both of them are, but I, I understand that. And Why is that? You think there's team. enough for both of them in the way that the, the yeah, offense that runs? Har I think, <clears throat> and again, Andrew's not doing this, but I think people are rose color <laughs> glassing what Stevenson did last year from his two great games that came with over 20 carries in both. Harris was doing that with what Aaron, Andrew just said, with split backfield. It's mm -hmm. like he was already scoring double digits in almost, I think it was 80 something percent of his games. He had like four single digit scores and one of them was nine and change. I don't need Harris to get 20 touches per game. The biggest thing and why I like both of them and why I'm with you guys on Stevenson, it's just I like both of them, is because if you fold James White's role into two running backs, which would be mostly Stevenson. I agree with you that he's going to be mostly in the passing game more than Harris will be, but there's not a third option. If Montgomery's not truly James White, then I can like both of them. If Ty Montgomery is truly back into the James White and Stevenson's going to be getting that, I'll be a little problem. bit 
So, so I actually believe this is going to be more two, as Andrew said, a different scheme. I think it's going to be more two than it used to be the three. And that's why I like them both. So I, I don't disagree, but I also disagree with the fact that I would take both of them. But don't worry, I'm Sanders, saving all of Andrew's rage for the next player that you don't like, because I think we're going to fight about that one. So he's going to get you back. The one after worry. this? The yeah, one yeah. After, okay, after that's Miles that's Sanders. None of us like Miles My, Sanders. Miles anything. Sanders, he is, it's like the himself. passing game. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, that's true. Look. He did say, don't draft me. I stink. <laughs> like he did come out and say that publicly. <laughs> well, so I have Kenneth Gainwell as a breakout running back this year. Not that I think he's going to get more than 150 touches, but I think 150 touches gets him as a solid RB3 in the McKissick, Hines, all these James White back when he was doing his thing, where it's going to be half, half, maybe you know, about half his value is passing game, half his value is rushing. I think he can run. I think people don't realize that he has the ability to run between the tackles. Not always, but maybe like a Philip Lindsay, where, oh, you know, he's a little bit better than I thought. But 150 touches, which means you're taking it away from everybody. Boston Scott's not going to go away. And what's the one thing that the Eagles told us last year that they told us from the year before, which they're still telling us this today is they're almost done with Miles Sanders in the passing game. They're like, mm-hmm. we know, you know, you had it before. Was something happened? Chuck Knobloch, if everybody remembers Chuck oh, Knobloch, yeah, he got the, the yips, yips in the passing game. Yeah. <laughs> something happened in the passing game and he can't do it anymore. Uh, so I'm out on Miles Sanders. And I think he's getting boosted because everybody's like, oh, there's no way he scores zero touchdowns again. Sure, whatever. But guess what? There's probably no way he ever gets to 225 touches again. All right. I'm going to stick with you, Jake, for this next one here. RBs okay. in the 76 to 100 range, because I want to make sure Erickson gets some shots in here on you. Who is the guy that you don't like in this range that you think? I know Sanders you had. He's going at 70. Uh, you have him at 81. This next guy that you talk about, he is currently at 78, but you've got him at 91. So that is certainly not a lot of love from Jake. No, because <clears throat> how many times are we going to try and play this game with the Josh Allen backfield? Uh, Devin Singletary was a top 20 running back when everybody else was like ex- out of the equation. It was just Singletary. And if that was the pro- look, if we were headed into this year and it was just Singletary again, if they didn't draft James Cook. Oh, and by the way, flirt with trying to get McKissick flirt with trying to get another pass catching option. And then they said, oh, crap, we can't get anybody. So we'll just draft James Cook. And we already know there. Are- I don't necessarily believe the Zach Moss involvement that we've seen so far already, if that's not necessarily like some stupid team to trade for him (laughs) because they're desperate. Like maybe he ends up in Seattle with the injury, but whatever it might be, it's two running backs. And anytime there's two running backs with Josh Allen, just like when there's two running backs with Cam Newton, just like when there's two running backs with everybody, like two running backs with a quarterback who's going to capitalize that much, especially in the rushing touchdown department. I don't want, and here's the thing about Josh Allen, you know, the whole tiger doesn't change his stripe situation. Mm -hmm. Bottom four, out of everybody who attempted 100 pass attempts last year, bottom four in targeting as running backs. Since Josh Allen has entered the league of all qualified quarterbacks, he's fourth worst at targeting his quarter. Sure, he could target his running backs more, but that'd be like, okay, that much more? Like, it's he, what, 13, 14% targets his running backs? It's just, it's not going to be in the passing game. It's going to be a split backfield. And if it is the passing game, it's going to be James Cook anyway. All right, Erickson, the Buffalo Bills ecosystem <laughs> is one that we're very excited about. Last year, Devin Singletary won a lot of people some championships, carried people into the playoffs as well. So do you have a counter argument here for the Devin Singletary hate that just gushes from Jake Seeley here? I just don't think it's going to be a a multifaceted backfield necessarily. I think that Singletary is clearly the starter. Like he proved last year, they unleashed him down the stretch. He was a top five running back and he only caught 14 passes. So I don't even necessarily need Devin Singletary to have this massive receiving role, you know, whether it's because Josh Allen isn't throwing to the running backs, whether it's because James Cook is operating in that role. I just don't want to totally forget about him being their locked and loaded RB1 last year. And he was third in the NFL in red zone touches. He had more red zone touches over the stretch of last year than Josh Allen did. So, I mean, is it too so crazy to think that Josh Allen, his rushing touchdowns come down as he makes a quote unquote business decision to take less hits on his body? I, I mean, I don't think that's really that crazy to think about. And Singletary's cheap. Like, he plays on the be- one of the best offenses in the NFL. He's going to have goal line opportunities. And he's already done it. Like, this isn't even like a projection. It's he literally did it at the end of last year. And I feel like we sometimes write off these end of year performances and everyone just ignores them. You know, I was guilty of it with Fournette. I was like, oh, no, I'm not buying into it. You know, they brought by Ronald Jones. I didn't give him that much money. I mean, Singletary didn't even play in the preseason game because he's their locked and loaded starter on offense. So I'm chasing the guys in the good offenses, and I think it'll work out for Singletary. I like where he's going in this range. 
Well, one of uh, both of us can at least <clears throat> agree on one thing that uh, nobody likes Zach Moss. So that's good. So at least <laughs> we can come back together on that. All right. Give me the guy in this range for you, Erickson, from 76 to 100 in ADP at the running back position that you are not fond of drafting. I'm going to go with Kenneth Walker, uh, rookie running back for the Seattle Seahawks. And this is really even before like the reports coming out about him getting some type of procedure done, whether it's on a sports hernia or not. OK, he's, he's banged up a little bit, but I just don't like to draft guys early down running backs that are going to be on teams that are going to be trailing in games like he's not going to be used in the passing game it, it's funny because pete carroll you know someone that you can obviously trust <laughs> super well you know comes as like oh we're confident about kenneth walker on all three downs and then in the first preseason game you know travis homer is running almost exclusively all the routes out of the backfield and kenneth walker is doing nothing now it's only one game but it clearly is not exactly what pete carroll was saying so based on seattle dead last in targets to running backs last year Rashad Penny is still there. I know that he's not someone that's going to be there in the long term, but if he's healthy, Rashad Penny, I think he's going to be the starting running back for the Seattle Seahawks. And you're just kind of waiting for him to get hurt to put Kenneth Walker in your lineup on a bad offense. So I just don't see, yes, he is a talented running back, but the situation in Seattle, I think, is absolutely horrible. And if he's not involved in the passing game, I don't want that running back on a team that's going to be trailing. So I'm out of Kenneth Walker right now. All right, so those are the names that the boys want to avoid. Nick Chubb, David Montgomery, Miles Sanders, and Devin Singletary for Jake. For Andrew at the current ADPs, Derek Henry, Antonio Gibson, Damian Harris, Ken Walker. Uh, let us switch gears to the wide receiver position. Somebody in the top 25. Now, Jake, you like all of these guys. You think they're all appropriate. <clears throat> so I want to ask you another question here because I am inappropriate most of the time. Tell me this. If you're looking right now in this top 25, who do you think has the best chance to finish outside of this ADP that won't return that value? Even though you like and you think they're all appropriate, if there's one guy you can see the downfall potentially in, who would it be? Mm, Tyreek Hill. Uh, just because I think there's a, a non-zero chance that Jalen Waddell outperforms Tyreek Hill just because. Ooh, you know. Oh, I love that. That just warmed my heart so much. <laughs> Say it again. Say it again for everybody to hear loud and clear. There's a possibility that Waddell is the better wide receiver for the <sighs> Dolphins this year. So I don't dislike Tyreek Hill. That's why I said I, I don't like I don't. All these wide receivers are inside my top 25. But Tyreek mm -hmm. Hill is the last one that checks in. And he's because he's not in the tier above that for where I he cuts off. He starts the next tier. And usually I don't mm -hmm. ever want to take a wide receiver or any player that starts a tier. And it's because we're sitting here assuming things should just roll over and be Hill's the number one, Waddle's the number two. What if it's reverse? Or what if this is DK Metcalf and Tyra Lockett version of the Dolphins? And the more valuable option is the more consistent option in this case, which might be Waddle. So I'd still take if it's my draft and you could just give me players, I would still take Hill over Waddle. But I think the gap should be very small. And mm -hmm. I think Waddle should be on the heel, like I'd say two or three spots and not necessarily here. So of all of them, I think Hill's the most likely to drop out of here. I personally have had them back to back in rankings for most of the offseason and kind of flip flopping back and forth. All right. Uh, so let's go to you with a guy in the top 25 at wide receiver, Andrew, that's just a little bit too risk price ratio for you that just doesn't compute. Uh, for me, it's Debo Samuel for the San Francisco 49ers. I just think that, you know, last year was the year to have Debo. And I, I think that if you hit on him and you were hiring him than Ayuk last year, then, you know, you pat yourself on the back. But now I think it's it's too inflated, you know, at this point. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, part of me, you know, being off Samuel last year had to do with Trey Lance being the quarterback. Like, I really thought that was going to happen, and that did not end up happening. And I think Jimmy Garoppolo, as someone that is a distributor of the football, someone that takes advantage of guys that might create yards after the catch, it was the perfect fit for Debo Samuel. And Brandon Ayuk was in the doghouse to start the year. George Kittle got banged up. Like everything kind of worked in Debo Samuel's favor. And then when those guys came back into the lineup in the second half of the season, all the running backs got hurt for the 49ers. So then Debo became RB1 as well as wide receiver one. He scored eight rushing touchdowns. He scored three touchdowns of 75 yards or more. And I get that these are highlighting his abilities as a player, but so much of it is not something that you can just bank on happening year over year. So I just don't like chasing the the magical season of a player and then his ADP rises so dramatically than the following year when what's really different about his situation than it was last year. Okay, the only thing that's different is they have now a mobile quarterback who's mm -hmm. probably going to suck passing attempts out of the out of the offense. And if anything, there's going to be less checkdowns to guys like Adebo Samuel, where Trey Lance will just tuck and run. Right. So for me, it's like, 
I didn't like Samuel for a lot of the reasons I just laid out last year. And now it's kind of the same situation, but now he's a second round pick. So I would rather just take Ayuk in round nine. He's going at 18 overall. You've got him at 27. And if anybody wants to check uh, not only Andrew's ranks, but mine, Jake, everybody can go to fantasypros.com slash rankings to do that. And you can see the ADPs that we're working off as well at fantasypros.com slash rankings. Uh, Andrew, let's stick with you. Give me a guy <clears throat> between 25 now and 50 that you feel like is not a wide receiver you're feeling at that ADP. I'm going to go with Deontay Johnson for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And this is a lesson I learned from last year about drafting wide receivers in like rounds three and four with bad quarterbacks who had projected to be target magnets. Um, it didn't work last year for me. <laughs> it was it was a really bad strategy. And I just got constantly burned by drafting these receivers too highly attached to question marks or bad quarterbacks. And that's the case with Pittsburgh. I, I don't know who the quarterback's going to be. Could it be Trubisky? Could it be Kenny Pickett? I mean, if it's Pickett, you look at the rookie wide rookie quarterbacks last year. You know, the best the best finisher last year at receiver attached to a rookie quarterback was Brandon Cooks, and that was wide receiver twenty. So it's like, okay, is Deontay Johnson going to be wide receiver twenty? And I kind of just am happy with that, like I guess. But I don't want receivers to be fine. I think that's a great litmus test of figuring out if a receiver is something you really want. Are you saying? Are they going to thrive and go to the moon in their situation or their quarterback, or are they going to be fine? Like people say, oh, DK Metcalf, he'll be fine. It's like, no, I don't want my receivers to be fine. I want them to excel, ascend, you know, put up fantasy points, and I want to be excited about them. And Deontay Johnson just doesn't really do that for me in an offense that I think is going to dial back the passing attempts with more inexperience at the quarterback position. Big Ben, last two seasons, the Steelers have been top two in pass play rate. So, I think they're going to feed Najee Harris a lot. I think that there's a lot of competition when it comes to targets with Claypool, Fryermuth, George Pickens, I think is a really talented guy. So I'm just out on Deontay Johnson, you know, as a, a round three, round four guy. In the words of Ross from Friends, Jake, is fine, just not good enough at that ADP for Deontay Johnson for you? No, because I'm I'm fine with I can remember that from the from Friends episode when she was sick. <laughs> I, I'm actually fine with uh, Deontay Johnson because this is where I'll push back with Andrew. There's not a lot that he said was wrong there, but what I'll push back the one thing that was left out. He said the quarterback play. Well, the last three seasons because I wrote an article about this. The last three seasons of Ben Roethlisberger is Mitch Trubisky. They're the same quarterback. That's how bad Beth Ro Ben Roethlisberger was the past three years. So I'm not concerned about Mitch Trubisky or Mitchell Trubisky or whatever the hell he wants to be called this year is at quarterback. M. Trub, Kenny I believe, is what we've been told. M. Trub. <laughs> Ken Kenny Pickett's another story uh, because I'm not a big Kenny Pickett guy. And where I will agree with Andrews, here's the downside to it. It's like, again, I'm not concerned about Mitch Trubisky versus Ben Roethlisberger. My concern is if Kenny Pickett comes in and what if he spreads it out more? What if he mm -hmm. doesn't like Deontay as much as Ben Roethlisberger? So that's where I'll agree. That's why I think he's fine here. So again, and it's a very small, Andrew has him like six spots behind. So it's not like he's hating, uh, don't let me speak for you too much, Andrew, but it's not like you hate him, hate him. It's just, you're just saying it's like a fine spot, but I actually think the spot is fair because you have to factor in, like if Pickett comes in and I do, I love Pickens, is that what if he spreads it around? What if Fryermuth gets a little bit of a bigger share and then you pull mm -hmm. down everybody? So again, that, that's why I actually prefer, if we just knew Trubisky was starting 17 games, I'd actually take Deontay in the top 30. Five, maybe 40. I, I, I want Trubisky a quarterback. Because then for you Deontay know what you're getting. It. That's that's fair. Yeah. And I, don't, I don't know if you're going to get or how much Trubisky you're going to get. I think you're going to get more picket than people realize. And I think if that scenario works out the way you're talking about, Jake, then they're going to regret giving Deontay Johnson money because that's if it moves on, <laughs> then all of a sudden, yeah. if it becomes Pickens and Pickett, that's a very different looking offense. And why'd you invest in the other guy? Now, Jake, the next guy that you don't want to invest in is a guy that I continue to struggle with. I like the player. I like the talent. Theoretically, he's yes. not a better quarterback, but I don't know what it is. I can't draft this guy. Talk to me about Terry I'll McLaurin. I'll tell you why. I'll tell why? You why why, can't, why do I have this hurdle here? I can't do it. Because it's not too different than what Andrew was just arguing for Deontay <laughs> Johnson. But I'll give you one thing on top of it. At least Deontay Johnson's finished top 10. The peak for Terry McLaurin, and we'll do points per game because not full season. They're like points per game. He's peaked at wide receiver 20. Peaked. And he's had all of the volume to himself for the past two years. All of it. Carson Wentz is not that big of an upgrade over Tyler Haneke. Go again, read that article, which I broke down. The big thing is the touchdown to interception ratio. I'll admit that. The touchdowns will be better 
under Carson Wentz than Heineke was. But are we going to say McLaurin's going to get to 10 touchdowns? Curtis Samuel's healthy as of today. I don't even care about Curtis Samuel because Jahan Dotson's out there. They brought back McKissick. We just talked about the backfield that they're going to still work on as the, uh, probably one of the more run-balanced teams in the league. I just don't think – I think people are still trying to put Carson Wentz and argue for that top five season he had years ago and think he's going to be the magic gift that we've given all these teams. And what did he do with Indianapolis? Like, why do we still keep saying Carson Wentz is going to make things better? What if he makes things worse like he just did with the Colts? So I love Terry McLaurin. You just said it. I can love players and hate their situations. And I think mm-hmm. Andrew was kind of saying that with Deontay Johnson. You can like the player and hate the situation. I love Terry McLaurin. I just, there's no way on earth I'm drafting him top 40 with what else is on the board, even at running back, when he's peaked at wide receiver 20 in points per game with 135 freaking targets. They just like, where's the upside? Thank you for verbalizing all of my inner feelings about Terry McLaurin, Jake. You did a <laughs> wonderful job. But I mean, it is. Like, he's there every time in every draft. And there he is. And I never take him. Plus, he craps share. all over the nickname we want to give him. That That's the other part of it, too. Scary Terry is the best nickname. You just take it, dude. And he's like, no, I don't want it. All right. Let's go back to you, Andrew Erickson. Let's continue to push the ADP. Let's push to 51 through 75. Who's the wide receiver that you're avoiding in this range? You go with Amari Cooper, wide receiver for ah. Cleveland Browns. <laughs> 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 Look, so the Deshaun Watson uh. stuff obviously is a plays a big role here where if Watson's going to at least miss the first six games, potentially more. But either way, I think we're just kind of looking at a receiver that's just going to be really boom or bust like he always is. Like last year, he was wide receiver 27 with Dak Prescott in arguably the best situation you could pretty much ask for from an offensive standpoint, you know, super fast in terms of pace of play, super pass heavy indoors. Like it was all set up for Dak Prescott or excuse me, for Amari Cooper. And he had a 36% bust rate last year, which was worse than Mike Williams, who basically wins like the most boom or bust award every time we talk about guys that are inconsistent. It was worse than AJ Green. And it was about the same as Darnell Mooney and Tyler Boyd. So that was within the confines of the Dallas Cowboys offense. Now you're moving him to Cleveland. Um, you look at Amari Cooper's splits, indoors and outdoors. I mean, his yards per target drops by like three yards. He just does not nearly perform as well when he's playing outside. And even if Deshaun Watson does come back towards the end of the season, the Browns play one game indoors over their final 10 games of the year. So, and it just happens to be at Houston. So who knew, even knows if they're gonna let Deshaun Watson play in that game? I don't even know. So Cooper is just gonna be a roller coaster ride. You're never gonna know when to start him. And I just don't want him on my team. Jake's like when you start him. Celia, you're, you're like an indoor cat. You perform much better inside, I feel like, <laughs> oh, than outside. Yeah, so I, I always wear jeans because I hate when I can't wear jeans and have right, to put on yeah. shorts. So there yeah, you go. Yeah. Uh, here's when you start Amari Cooper. You start him every single week as your wide receiver three, Andrew. But that's why, because you get him as your wide receiver three, 120 targets. I, I actually, you know what? Here's my pushback on this. And this is why I went, bah, this is my pushback. <laughs> if it is Brissett for 17 games, I'm actually okay with that because guess what? He's not getting the ball downfield to Donovan Peoples-Jones and anybody else in this <laughs> offense. He's just going to pepper the living hell of an Amari Cooper. So yes, I could understand the 120 targets could probably be some of the worst 120 targets in the league, but it's 120 targets, 120 targets. As a wide receiver, three. I'll agree with Andrew. It's like, if you had to take him as your two, like you have in past years, I don't want him there. But if I have him as my three, hell, you don't even have to. You're getting him as your four in most drafts right now. And so I'll take him there. So again, I'm fine. Not disagreeing with Andrew on his take. I'm you can disagree. This is a safe no, no, no. place. I, I've already disagreed with him several times. I'm I know. Saying, it's I, becoming I like more fact- and more like Ricky Bobby's I- relationship <laughs> with the head of the racing company. Like, with all due respect, Andrew, with all due respect, I hate your take about No, Amari so if Cooper, I have three I wide it. receivers and two running backs and he's my four, I'm happy. If I have two running backs, a tight end, and three wide receivers and he's my third, I'm okay with that too. I don't want him higher. I'll agree with him there. Uh, the one so that I don't want. 67 and ADP is a comfortable place for you. It's a ra- yeah, the names that are on the board, comfortable. There's probably some names I'm still going to take in front of them. Who but... are the names you're going to take in front of them? Well, that's why we're here today. Board. Well, look at the board. Well, take a moment. I, look I'm, at the board. Give me those names so I'm people going can know to. those names. We're trying to so make people right, smarter here. Michael on the show Thomas. Game. Michael Thomas, no Agreed. question about it. It was like Agreed. back to back. Uh, that's right behind them. You can make a case for Darnell Mooney. I'm taking Juju Smith-Schuster everywhere. Why are we ignoring the potential? That, like Juju Smith-Schuster, he, but next, next week's my article of last year's trash. He is the picture. I'm going to put 10 pictures of him in this article of like, just draft Juju <laughs> like Smith-Schuster. Like a nice collage we, kind of thing. That's sweet. We're screwing nice. around with rookies and Marquez Valdez-Scantling and Mikko Hart. Like the answer's in your effing face. Why are we ignoring <laughs> Juju Smith-Schuster? Wow. Like, wow. So anyway... 
Uh, yeah. Besides Cooper, <laughs> let's see who else. I might if. Uh, Schultz, if Schultz is still there, which he's going in front of Cooper, I still I would take Schultz at tight end because that okay. cuts off my top six tight ends, and I want a top six tight end this year. All right, so there's Hulk. other names there. There's the, right. there's a few other names. So all right, not all me. right, Hulk. Go back to being Bruce Banner for a second, <laughs> and then we'll continue on with the show. All right, let's continue to push the ADP a little bit more. Let's stay in this same range here. Uh, Jake, give me the player that you don't care for in this same range here where we're talking an ADP at wide receiver and this range is 51 through 75. Yeah, it's, it's Adam Thielen at 72. Again, mm-hmm. another one. I don't yeah. hate, hate Adam Thielen, but at, at this point, everybody's, you know, Kevin O'Connell is going to improve the offense and more passing. Realize they, they passed a hell of a lot last year. They sure they, did. They, and if you compare the passing of the Vikings versus the two years of Kevin O'Connell with the Rams, it's like five more attempts over an entire season. It's a very close number from last year. So if you want to carry over last year, cool, sign me up because 600 pass attempts. That's But are they really going to pass 650 times? Like we're just going to like erase Dalvin Cook from all of his touches, which I'm like a little bit concerned that Dalvin Cook shares more with Alexander Madison, but that's not even this. It's just KJ Osborne and Irv Smith, I think are legitimate weapons. I love yeah. some Irv Smith this year. I just don't necessarily see where Adam Thielen is going to improve on last year and part of it yeah he missed games but when was the last time Adam Thielen didn't miss games like he's starting to rack up in age missed time he's touchdown reliant which he has the Tyra Lockett type connection with Russell Wilson that he does with Kirk Cousins I don't think that's really going to go anywhere but unless you're going to well it can't go anywhere if it's not on the field if you're on the field it's harder to make that connection work and I I feel like this situation Jake's kind of like reminiscent of what we talked about with the Bears where it's just like I can have KJ Osborne for free later on like Khalil Herbert I'd rather just yes. make that investment later on. Is that the same feeling for you? And that's the thing. Is that, yeah, where he is and the names that are on the board, 100%. You know, Adam Thielen was top 25 in points per game, but he doesn't check in because he missed games again. And mm-hmm. so Adam Thielen, 95 targets in 13 games. Does he get to 120 if he plays all 17? Probably. But would we really sit here on any show? And if we had it, if we had to place bets and said he gets 120 targets, is he going to improve on 10 touchdowns from last year or just repeat it? That's so again, I don't dislike Adam Thielen. I just dislike where he's going in relative to other names around him. All right, let's push again to 75 through 100. Let's talk about these names here. Andrew Erickson, give us the wide receiver that you are not fond of drafting at the current ADP. For me, it's DeAndre Hopkins because I think right now he's still being drafted as he's in the back end wide receiver three range. And it's like mm-hmm. you can draft guys that you can start week one, whereas Hopkins, you have to sit on him for six weeks before you get any type of return on your investment. So just from a strategic roster management standpoint, I don't want him on my roster because I want to be able to have the flexibility to make roster moves. Now it changes a little bit if you have an IR spot, but still I want to be stashing potentially other players. Like there's so much, the waiver wire is so crucial crucial during the start of the year. And I don't want some type of player holding me back from going after a Cordero Patterson or an Elijah Mitchell because, oh, I got Hopkins. I want to make sure I have him. And then I'm not even necessarily sure what we're going to get from Hopkins when he comes back because we look at him last year. You know, I know he was banged up, but he had one game with double digit targets and two games with 80 or more receiving yards. Like he was not the same alpha wide receiver that we've seen so many years before. He's getting older. And in 2020, just one year prior, you know, he saw double digit targets in eight games and went over 80 receiving yards seven times. So you're adding in Marquise Brown to the, to the fold. Does Kyler Murray, do, do those guys gel? What does Rondell Moore's role look like if he takes another step forward in year two? So I just don't think we're going to get the same like Hopkins mega target magnet that we've seen throughout the years. And I just don't want the headache of having the roster guy for six weeks when I can make other moves. Would you be somebody who would trade for DeAndre Hopkins if you didn't want to draft him? Yeah, I think that that would definitely be something more in play because if a team drafts him and this starts out 0-3, it's like, right. oh, here you go. Like This is exactly who you'd want to trade for. So, yeah, I definitely would be open to trading for him because his value is going to depreciate because people are going to get sick of waiting for him to come back. All right, Jake, back to you here. Let's close out wide receivers 76 through 100. Who's the guy that you don't want at the current ADP? So I have his this wide receivers ADP very close to Hopkins. I'm actually in between where Erickson. So I'm like, I have Hopkins at 111. I'm in between. So I'm, I get everything Erickson's saying. And it's just like basically just but I don't have him as far down as he does. So lower than his ADP, but higher than Erickson, but not by much. Uh, right in this range, I have Ayuk. We, we talked about him earlier in the show. 
again, it's not like I dislike Ayuk, but I think part of it too is like this recent talk of like looks amazing and catching everything, blah blah. Here's what I go back to when you brought up Debo is that something has to give here. Like we can't have Debo as a top 10 wide receiver. Ayuk is a top 36 wide receiver. Travis Kelsey is the third wide, or Travis, George Kittle is the third tight end. You can't, ha- something's got to give here. Trey Lance isn't throwing for 5,000 yards. Trey Are Lance sure? isn't throwing, throwing <laughs> for 35 touchdowns. He 300 touchdown. attempts in college. I mean, I love Trey Lance, but that was, that was the thing that was so stunning to me. I was looking at it. I was like, man, this guy's thrown like less than 400 pass attempts in the last three years. <laughs> so that's something to think about a little bit. I mean, look, look, the comp- Comparison's been made to Josh Allen. I've made the same comparison to Josh yeah. Allen's second year in the league to point to Trey Lance's fantasy value to say this is why he's a top ten quarterback in fantasy because you just take Josh Allen's second year, he was QB seven. You know what he did that late that year? He threw three thousand yards and twenty touchdowns. Even if he became Josh Allen, who Josh Allen is today, you're still talking about three options of where these guys are going. Something has to give. If it's Ayuk, and I could. We could be wrong. We could say, Erickson pointed out why Debo's too high for that spot. What if Ayuk is his favorite weapon? And then, okay, this is a fine spot to take Ayuk because it's upside here. Ayuk will finish higher than that. Well, then Debo's got to give. You can't, that's what I'm saying here. It's like, you can't have all three of them where they're going and say it's going to happen. Something has to give. Either all three of them are going to take a tick down or somebody's going to be left out of the equation. And I just feel like if it's Ayuk, it's going to be worse than Debo because at least Debo's guaranteed touches with the backfield work. So if somebody gets left out, I just don't think it's Kittle either because he can't be guarded by most teams in the defensive side of things. So again, I can like Ayuk. I just don't like the fact that we're having to pay for him at this price. Like I'd rather get him two rounds cheaper before all this news started building up. I've got Ayuk pretty much ranked right where Jake has him. So right outside the top 100. So I've been- Yeah, that's 10 spots. Yeah. Yeah. 106. And it's like, I think it's crucial that I I don't want to necessarily have to start him week one because I really want to see how things kind of play. Like if he becomes your like first bench receiver, because we see guys get banged up in this offense all the time. So if he becomes, if it becomes a two man, okay, it's between Kittle and Ayuk or it's just Debo and Ayuk, then the concentrated targets, I think are going to helpful and you're going to see Ayuk really take a step forward. So that's why I really like him as a wide receiver four, and that's why I have him ranked, you know, right outside the top 36. All right. So in case you were paying attention to the show, nobody likes any receivers at their current ADP on the 49ers between <laughs> Jake and between Andrew Erickson. There you have it, folks. Uh, but but still, you know, let me put this to you. Would you rather have Debo at his ADP or Brandon Ayuk at his, uh, Jake? Ayuk. Ayuk. Okay. Erickson, same question. Yeah, because there's less risk. He's a, he guy right. goes in round eight, whereas Debo's round two. It was like, if you miss your round two pick, that's going to be really costly. Whereas if Ayuk doesn't fire, it's not nearly going to hurt you as much. Let's hit the mailbag before we head out for today. And of course, this mailbag question comes via our Discord at fantasypros.com slash chat, which you can join for free today. Go check it out again. That's fantasypros.com slash chat. It's from the kid in the hall who has a great little uh, great little avatar here of a guy crush your head. You never seen kids in the hall? Go see it. Go, go to YouTube. It's hilarious. Mailbag question. Last year, we all knew that Stafford was going to supercharge the Rams passing attack. I had all the shares of Robert Woods I could collect, missing out on the Cooper Cup domination. This year, it seems that Russ may cook in Denver with Sutton being the consensus benefactor. What are your thoughts about drafting both Sutton and Judy to hedge the potential of one of them breaking out as your wide receiver one? Jake, what are your thoughts on this duo in Denver and this strategy altogether, whether it be Chase and Higgins on a good offense or having two guys on the same offense or specifically these two guys in Denver? Yeah, so it, there's a couple factors that come into play here. Is I don't mind having two players from the same team. You just mentioned before, we've actually seen Thielen and Jefferson finish as top 10 wide receivers. Multiple times we saw Packers wide receivers doing it. T. Higgins in a points per game was wide receiver 12, so you just had two Bengals do it. So I don't have a problem with it. Gabriel Davis, a lot of people are not, there's a world where Gabriel Davis finishes top 15 wide receiver this year. The good thing here is you're not paying top 10 for Sutton and top 20 for Judy. Now, recently, even in the flex draft, as Erickson saw, Sutton crept into the top 12. I'm a little bit out on that because now you're paying for Sutton to be the best case scenario of Sutton. But if you're going to give me at their current ADP in most drafts, I have no problem taking Sutton around wide receiver 20 and Judy around wide receiver 30 to 35 because, again, I don't want to start both, but there's a world where they could be your one and two. And, at, you know, as you're two and three, that's OK. They're, you're opening yourself up for some risk in the weeks that it goes bomb. But to the point of what he's saying is 
I think there's a world where both of them are top 30 wide receivers. So I'm okay with it. Now, again, if the if the price starts rising on both or especially Sutton, then I'm out on doing it. All right, uh, Erickson, real quick from you, because we got some breaking news I want to hit here at the end of the show real quick that regards to Sean Watson. So uh, I know you love Sutton. How much are you going to go here uh, in terms of getting him and a Judy or you're just clearly just staking your claim? Well, in retrospect to the, you know, the, the Discord talking about the how Cooper Cup, you know, if this person had done it with Cooper Cup and Robert Woods, like it would have worked out. Like even though Robert Woods got hurt, if they had drafted Cup too, then it wouldn't have mattered because Cup was good enough for both of the, you know, draft slots essentially. So I think that it's fine to do. You know, I'm obviously higher on Sutton, so I want to make sure that he's like my number one guy. But if I miss out on him, like I still acknowledge that Judy has a lot of upside. You know, he's still a talented guy. It's a good situation for him to be in. And we've seen, you know, Russ have concentrated target shares where it's like, in Seattle, it was DK and Lockett and then nobody else. And really, you know, Tim Patrick, his him being gone really makes it more possible that you do see a more concentrated target share between Judy and Sutton because, you know, we're excited about Albert O, we're excited about KJ Hamler, but they're still really unestablished types of guys that you don't necessarily project, oh, well, he's going to see a 20% target share. Like, not necessarily. So, yeah, I, I think that it's fine as well. All right, real quick, just 30 seconds, 45 seconds each on this. According to Pro Football Talk, they're saying right now, again, this is all just breaking literally as we're doing this four minutes ago. Yeah. So we'll see if it gets verified by other sources. Well, Pro Justina Football Anderson, Talk. Jonathan Jones, Aaron Wilson are all. Oh, so we got a couple. Yeah, all right. So now it's all going across here uh, that Deshaun Watson is going to receive 11 game suspension this year. Five million dollar fine. Jake, is Deshaun Watson relevant at all in the fantasy season of 2022? Mm, to what Andrew was talking about before with Hopkins, I'd say no, unless you're playing super, super flex, obviously, but you're going to stash a quarterback. You're going to stash any player that you can't put in your IR mm -hmm. because of suspension, not an IR. You're going to stash somebody for 11 games. Now you're talking the playoffs. They're about to start in fantasy. So you're going to wait that entire time. Mm -hmm. I think you have to know your league and play it and then hopefully try to grab them off the waiver wire. Maybe week seven and try to stash them at that point. Erickson, same feeling for you or. Yeah, I think so. And I think it just like lowers the players in the beginning of the season. Now, if you're speaking like best ball, it's like, okay, like he can help you be different, you know, in the tournament weeks where a lot of these best ball mm -hmm. tournaments, cause he will be playing. And so that does give, I think from a best ball perspective, some of these Browns players makes them a little more interesting because they have spike week potential with Watson at quarterback in week 16 or 17. So I like, you know, stashing Watson week seven or other Browns players that, you know, kind of just don't do anything because of Jacoby. Yeah, so you're training for Amari Cooper after week seven? I, yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I would train go. for Amari Cooper. Dude, he always blows up, especially because I know. <laughs> Drafting and trading, <laughs> very different worlds. We talked about it earlier in the show that just because you, you don't want to draft a player doesn't mean you're not going to have shares of him as the season progresses. I'll have all the shares always of my good pal, Jake Sealy. Jake, great to uh, chat with you today. You follow him on the Twitter machine at all in kid and check out all of his great work at the athletic as well and of course andrew erickson working feverishly here at fantasy pros as well and well those guys both deserve a miller light and so do you so head over right now to millerlight.com slash buy beer online get all the beer for your draft right now get it done again only 96 calories it's it's practically good for you i mean come on look 96 calories you can have a few beers kick back Make a few picks. Convince somebody to take all the Browns that you can. Again, that's MillerLite.com slash online. And don't forget to check out our Fantasy Fest coming Monday, August 29th on our YouTube channel. Subscribe today and click that little bell till it goes ding for notifications. Again, that's 3 p.m. Eastern, August 29th on the Monday. And let's get the whole deal ready to go. Get yourself the Fantasy Pros Draft Kit. It's available right now. The Fantasy Football Draft Kit at fantasypros.com slash kit. It's free. It's got everything you need to dominate your drafts. And if you want a little bit more, go to fantasypros.com slash offers, make a small deposit, and you get upgraded six free months of premium Fantasy Pros for your draft, for your in-season, for everything, for your life. It just makes life better. All of our tools here at Fantasy Pros, that'll do it for us. But the story of the game goes on for Jake Seeley and Andrew Erickson. I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.